On May the 25th, 2001, Eric Weyenmayer climbed to the peak of Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. 90% of the people that attempt that never make it to the top. 219 people have died trying. He was one of just 3,000 people who have been successful. So what is so different about him? Eric Weyenmayer is totally blind. He lost his eyesight at age 13 due to a degenerative eye disease, but became the first blind person ever to uh, reach the peak of Mount Everest, in large part because of one thing. He listened well. He, he listened to the little bell tied to the back of the climber in front of him so he would know which direction to go. He listened to the voice of teammates who would shout back to him, death fall two feet to your right, so he would know which direction not to go. He listened to the sound of his pick jabbing the ice so he would know whether the ice was safe to cross. The thing that ensured the success of his adventure was the fact that he was listening. Well, the Old Testament speaks of someone who was listening for God. His name is Samuel. Uh, we read about him in the book that is named after him. 1 Samuel chapter 1 is where we'll begin this morning. I'll begin with verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathim Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Now, from my part, I'm glad we don't name kids like that anymore. <laughs> Just saying. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Verse 11, And she, Hannah, vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Verse 20, Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Well, we see in verses 1 through 8 a divided home. Elkanah seemed to be a good and godly man except for one thing. He had two wives. Now, you, you saw that a lot back that time, but it was never pleasing to God. And so the fact that he had two wives was common, but still not one of those things that God smiled on. Apparently he married Hannah first, and then when discovered that she couldn't have kids, married Penina so he could have a family. See, he didn't, uh, he didn't want to wait for God's plan. You know, he will to do things his way in his time, and so he, he got ahead of, uh, ahead of God on that. And Penina used that situation to aggravate Hannah. The name Hannah means woman of grace. And she certainly exhibited grace in the way she dealt with her circumstance and her co-wife, uh, woman of grace, is, is what she was. No doubt that experience and those uh, situations helped to mold her to become the, the woman of character and faith that she was. And then in verses 9 through 18, we see a devout prayer. Hannah fervently prayed to God for a son. Not, not just a child. She prayed for a son. Uh, it was a prayer of submission because she promised God that if He would grant her a son, she would do whatever He asked of her. Uh, so she was submitting to God, but it was also a prayer of sacrifice because she vowed that uh, she would return her son to God as a Nazarite to serve him all of his life. That there were uh, 
other notable Nazarites in, in Scripture. The Nazarite vow was a very interesting uh, thing. We, we know that it could be uh, a certain number of days. In certain cases, it was a lifetime vow, and, and that's the case here with, uh, with Samuel. We know that Samson was a Nazarite. Uh, we know John the Baptist. And so there were others in Scripture uh, that had that lifetime a vow and Samuel uh, being one of them, but 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 she prayed a devout prayer to God. She she it was a fervent prayer, uh, just a a prayer from her heart of hearts, praying to God for uh, for a son. John Bunyan said, "In prayer, it's better to have a heart without words than words without heart." And so we know from her prayer that she meant it with all her heart. Then in verses 19 through 28, we see a distinguished son. It seems that when critical things are at stake, God sends a child to do a man's job. You know, he did that in the case of Jesus, sends a baby, you know, to be born in a manger, to, to grow up to be the Savior of the world. Uh, he, he sent this baby uh, at, a, at a critical time uh, in, into this world. Hannah, Hannah uh, after the morning of her prayer, learned of her conception. And, and uh, when her son was born, named him Samuel, which means asked of God. She had asked God for a son. And so she named him accordingly. Uh, they, they raised him to about the age of three, uh, about the time that you'd wean a child, and then took him to the tabernacle to release him to God's service. Ah, the, the closest I can relate to that is, is when we took our daughter Ashley and dropped her off at college. Uh, some, some of you have been there. Uh, er, everybody at church kept telling me how hard that was going to be on me. And I thought, <laughs> don't you love that word? Uh, not me, I thought, not me. Maybe Brenda, you know, she's probably the one that's going to... It, but it did. They were right. <laughs> uh, I should have listened more carefully at that uh, council. And they, they were right. I mean, uh, we drove her to Arkansas Tech and unloaded her stuff to the dorm there. And, you know, we just kept hanging around trying to get things in place and help her decorate and all this other and trying to make that moment last as long as it could. I see some nodding heads there. And, and I know Ashley was standing there that whole time, you know, uh, underneath her, twiddling her thumbs. And, you know, she wanted us to go on so she could get on with what she was there for. But we, we wanted to stretch it, you know, just, just hated. Uh, but the moment came where we had to, you know, drive off and watched her as she walked across campus, you know. And uh, it was an adventure for her. It was heartbreaking for me. You know, for for day for weeks, I'll be honest with you, I just I just didn't really even care if I got up in the morning. Uh, you'd walk by her room, you know, and, and she wasn't in there. Pull up in at the house, and her car wasn't in the driveway. I, uh, our church had built a youth uh, complex uh, next to the gym, and so uh, I I would go in there and just uh, sit in one of those old cold folding metal chairs. And just cry because uh, Ashley wasn't going to be there now. I, I know some of you are relating. You're on track with me. Uh, but to just, you know, see her go off and not be there. And, and she was 18 or 19 years old. Samuel was about three years old. And to just take him and leave him. To fulfill the promise that she had made to God. Uh, scripture tells us later on that she would take every year when they go to make their yearly sacrifice, she'd take him a little coat, you know. Uh, you know, you can't outgrow a coat in a year. And so she would make him one. And, and so she had a whole year to work on that little coat. Don't you know she put everything she had into that? Just meticulous work. Because that's all she could do for him now. And, and so she would sew and, and do all the, and so that she could have that coat to take to him that year. But, but they took him and just turned him over to, to God. Uh, see, Israel's future hope lay in that young man. 
uh, he learned to serve God in the tabernacle. And uh, by the way, because of her obedience uh, in fulfilling her promise to God, later he blessed her with five more kids, five more children. Not that they took the place of Samuel, because he would always have a place in her heart, but I think God smiled on her fulfillment of, of her commitment uh, by doing that. Uh, in, in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel there, we, we see that Eli the priest uh, in the tabernacle kind of took young Samuel under his, under his wing, you know, trained him in the, in the service of God. And, and uh, Samuel went on to become a great, great worker, great servant uh, for the Lord. He was Israel's last judge and also the first in a new line of prophets. Uh, Warren Wiersbe said, Samuel was God's bridge builder at a critical time in the Jews' history. At a time where everything seemed shake, uh, shaky, he gave leadership to Israel and helped move them towards spiritual rededication. Samuel was uh, the one who established the first seminary, as we would know it, Bible college. He also anointed the first two kings of Israel, Saul, who was the people's choice, and then David, who was God's choice. Samuel anointed both of those. Uh, I, I believe the key to Samuel being the, the leader that he was and the great man of God that he was, was his willingness to listen to God. He learned that at an early age. Uh, listening is a lost art. You know, we don't listen to people. <laughs> you, you, you know what it's like to be standing there talking to somebody and they've got that glazed over look in their eyes? They're, they're not hearing a word you're saying. Some of you are like that to me right now. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> Just joking. I can't see, I can't see far, <laughs> farther from the end of this pulpit. But, uh, usually when you're talking to somebody and that glazed look comes over, all they're doing is waiting for you to shut up so they can say what they want to hurry up and say, you know. But w w w listening, it's a lost art. You know, the story is told of uh, Franklin Roosevelt when he was president, said he, he hated those long uh, receiving lines. Uh, dignitaries and people as they come through and he endured those far more than he enjoyed them and some, somebody asked him well, why don't you, he said because nobody listens to a thing I say you know, and so one day he was scheduled to be at one of these and, and uh, he thought I'm just going to try something you know, I can see the glint in his eye when he, I'm, I'm going to try something. So as these people come through the receiving line, they shake his hand and, and he would say to them I murdered my grandmother this morning. <laughs> the next one would come by and shake his hand. He would say, I murdered my grandmother this morning. And, and he would get responses like, oh, marvelous. You're doing such a good job. <laughs> We're so proud of you. <laughs> Which proved his point. Then the ambassador for Bolivia came, came by, stuck out his hand and shook it, and he said, I murdered my grandmother this morning. And so here, here's this dignitary, you know, and he doesn't know quite how to respond to that. So when he collected his thoughts, he said, well, I'm sure she had it coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, he... he he made his point. He proved his point. And we don't listen to people. And, you know, uh, we should work harder at it. Listening to people, it's important. And we, we do need to work harder at it. But uh, listening to God is critical. Listening to God is crucial. Chapter uh, 3 uh, there tells us of an incident. One night when Eli was old and, and he was almost blind... Uh, Samuel was probably about 12 years old. And one night as they slept in the tabernacle, uh, Samuel heard his name. And, and he ran to Eli, who was asleep. And he said, here I am. Well, uh, he, Eli, you know, uh, he didn't know what to do. Uh, here, here's a, a good point. Uh, the mark of a uh, faithful servant is an attentive ear and an immediate response attentive ear, and an immediate response. And so Samuel hears his name. He rushes to Eli. Here I am. 
Well, uh, Eli said, I, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Uh, and, and, and so he did. The same thing happened again and then again. See, Samuel had never really heard God's voice before then, and so he assumed when his name was, it was Eli calling him. And so he gets up and as he's trained and run to him. Uh, after the third time then, Eli realized that it was God calling Samuel's name. And, and so he, he counseled the young man. He said, go, go back to bed, and if he calls again, uh, say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. He, he gives him that, that wisdom. And so Samuel went, that, went back to bed, and, and then the Lord did call again, but he called twice, Samuel, Samuel. And so Samuel responded as he had been counseled to do, and he said, yes, Lord, your servant hears. Uh, and then a strange thing happened. The Lord came and stood there, visibly. It, in theological terms, it's called a theophany. It's an Old Testament appearance of the Lord. You don't see that much. You do see it some, and this is one of those times. The Lord just came and, and was right there by Samuel. Uh, See, because Samuel was willing to listen, God spoke to him. And, and, and God revealed the future plans for Israel to this, to this young man. There's, there's three things about that incident that, that I want us to look at this morning. And the first is the issue of proximity. The issue of closeness. Proximity. See, when, when, when God called, Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was. Now, the Ark represented God. And so he's sleeping here by God. In the eyes of those people, that piece of furniture represented God. And, and, and the Bible is clear where Samuel is sleeping. You know, uh, God could have just included Samuel was sleeping, but it's almost like God wanted us to know where he was sleeping. He's sleeping in the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was. And, and uh, uh, I, I think God is trying to tell us here that uh, proximity or closeness is, is a critical thing. If you're going to hear God, you've got to be near God. That has not changed in all these centuries. If you want to hear God, you've got to be near God. God. James chapter 4 and verse 8 tells us, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. You ever been talking to somebody and like, like husbands, okay, y'all that are husbands, if you're standing there, you know, washing dishes and your wife, okay, that, that's a far-fetched example, okay. Uh, okay, the wife is standing there doing the dishes and the husband is buying and all this stuff and she's talking away while she's got her back to him. You know, and, and then she looks around and, and you're gone. <laughs> and she's just been there chatting away and you hadn't been anywhere even close. That's kind of frustrating, isn't it? Because you know that if they're not near, they didn't hear. And it's the same way with us. You know, if we're going to hear God's voice, we've got to be close to Him. Uh, not physically so much as spiritually in our hearts. Uh, I'm not going to take a poll like a raising hand kind of poll, but just a poll in your mind. Do, do you think God is any more in, in this room, church, than He is anywhere else? Don't, don't, don't even respond. Just think about it. Is, is He here more than He is somewhere else? I know over the years there have been times that in the, in the town or community that we've lived, there's been like tragedy. And, and we would open the church at certain times for people to come in and pray. Now, people did. I mean, we lost a pastor once in, a, uh, in, a, in a, an auto accident, and we opened for days. We'd open the church, you know, so people could just come in and, and just pray. As, as if God is here more than He's somewhere else. Now, if you want to, that's okay. If it makes you feel better to believe He's here more than so, that, that's okay. But honest truth is, God's not any more here than He is with you anywhere you go. Because, see, He's not limited to one location, he's, He lives in our hearts. 
but in, in this situation, I think God wanted us to know Samuel was sleeping and he was right there where God was. Because see, to those people, that Ark of the Covenant, it, it, it represented God. And, and so he, he includes that detail uh, for us. Uh, the second thing is the issue of priorities. Samuel heard, he got up, he went back to bed. Samuel heard, he got up, he went back to bed. Samuel heard, he got up, he went back to bed. Man, talk about inconvenient. You know, you, you, you're you asleep, you know, and you get woken up by something, and then it's about the time you get back to sleep, you woke uh, There's two things you don't mess with, and that's a man's food and his sleep. This, uh, that's off limits, okay? You don't mess with it. A uh, man's food or sleep. Now, uh, Brenda wasn't in the early service. She's right behind me today and has pretty quick access to a big heavy hymnal, so I'm going to tread carefully here. Uh, uh, she is a superb housekeeper. And I don't say that joking at all. I mean, she, she is meticulous in, in, in her housekeeping uh, to the point that I wonder, why? You know, I mean... But she does. I mean, I, I'm sure she learned that from her mother, but she is. Her, her idea of a, a waste basket is uh, it's a very temporary holding place for a piece of trash until she can get it emptied. My conception of a waste basket, fill it up, empty it, and then start all over. You know? Soap, rinse, and repeat. Uh, she, I mean, she's just she's she's meticulous, I, and I appreciate that about her. Uh, but sometimes it's to the point. I don't even get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom because by the time I get back, she's already made up my side of the bed. <laughs> so I just hold it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to say that in church, you know. But <laughs> now people are watching it around the world. But that'll teach you to be gone, Brother Roger. <laughs> but you, you know. But at this point, uh, God is messing with Samuel's sleep. <laughs> you know, go to sleep, wake up, get up, go to sleep, wake up. He, he's messing with his sleep. But you know, God often calls us to do things that don't fit our schedule. He just does. But if we're going to grow spiritually, grow closer to Him and be better workers and servants for Him, we better learn to be inconvenienced. Uh, to, to, to rearrange our priorities to, to suit His will for our lives. Uh, even if it's not what we would choose for ourselves or not the way we would do it. He, he knows what's going on, and so we, we need to, to make Him the priority spot in our lives. And then thirdly, we see the issue of permission. Eli's advice to Samuel was, when he calls again, give him permission to speak. Yes, Lord, your servant. Give God permission to, to, to speak. God is not a bully, and he, He's not going to force Himself into into a heart or a situation, he's got to be invited. And so uh, if you find yourself maybe being a little distant from God, he, he's not the one that's mo It's us, okay? It's always on us. Uh, and, and so we have to allow him to speak if we're going to hear him. Now, I don't be believe God speaks audibly today like he did uh, in this. I'm a Baptist and I couldn't handle it if he did, you know. But... Uh, but, but He does speak through us to, through various ways. Uh, he can speak to us through a, a restless spirit. You know, I, I know uh, friends of mine who pastor churches and, and, and work on staff in churches, and, 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 and they speak of getting, getting just a restless spirit. And sometimes that's God, you know, speaking to you. Sometimes He speaks to us through difficulties or uh, uh, circumstances. You know when God is speaking to you. If you're in tune at all with Him, you know when, when He's uh, speaking to you. He, he may impress something on your heart through the ministry of, of the Holy Spirit and, and just uh, speak to your heart. And, and, and there's never a doubt if, if you're listening to God. But the most important way He speaks to us is through His Word, through, through the Bible. Uh, Charles Stanley said, when God speaks... He is speaking to you. Everything in the Bible applies to your life in some way. 
Each of us should take His Word personally. Even the Old Testament. <laughs> you know, I joked earlier in the first service about, you know, reading through my Bible again, and I'm to one of those, but it's kind of tough, to be honest with you. It's, you know, it's a struggle, you know. Uh, and, and, and even that has something in it for me. One of these days, I'm going to be glad to find out what it was. But uh, whatever God says in His Word, it, it's for me, and I should, I should take it personally uh, and give God permission to speak. You know, when you sit down and read your Bible, pray that God will help you understand what you're reading and show you things. Every, every time I read, there's something in there that I'm pretty sure somebody slipped in and put it in since I read it last time. I had never seen it before. And, and all of a sudden, there it is. Something just this last week. I don't remember now exactly what it was. But I had never seen that before. And so when he speaks through his word, he's speaking to me. And if I'll listen with the ear of my heart, I'll hear what he's got to say to me. Depends on what you're listening for. Back in the day when <clears throat> the telegraph was still, you know, the best means of communication, a, a young man responded to an ad uh, for a Morse code operator. And so he showed up that day and he walks into this busy, noise-filled office, you know, and all these people are there for that same job. And, and uh, you know, the hustle and bustle and in the background you can hear a Morse code, you know, ticking away uh, and all that. Well, a sign was there and it instructed the folks that were there to fill out the application and sit down and wait to be called in for the, for the interview, which this young man did. Uh, well, in just a moment then, he got up and walked straight into the boss's office. All these other people had been, been there for hours, some of them. They're, okay, what's going on here, you know? And they're getting a little irate about that, uh, not understanding uh, what's going on. And so just in a minute then, the young man comes back out of the office with the boss. And he announces, uh, thank you all for coming. The job has just been filled. Well, now they're really uh, uh, upset and, and irate. And, and one said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He was the last one to get here. We didn't even get to be interviewed. And now he, he, he got the job. That's just not fair. And the, and the boss responded, I'm sorry, but the whole time you've been sitting here, the Morse code in the background has been ticking away. Uh, if you understand this message, come right in. The job is yours. He understood the message. He came in. The job is his. See, it depends on what you're listening for. There's a lot of hustle and bustle in all of our lives. And if we're not really careful... That'll be what we hear when God tries to speak to us. But it depends on what you're listening for. And, and, and so, uh, my question for you is today, are you listening for the voice of God? Are the ears of your heart tuned upward? The Holy Spirit says through the writer in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, Today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart. If you hear His voice, don't ignore it. Uh, remember, uh, Hannah prayed for a son. God gave her a son. She gave him back to God, and then He blessed her with five more children. I think if when Hannah uh, saw little Samuel and said, I know what I promised God, but, and she decided just, God wouldn't have blessed her with five more kids. But because she uh, responded in obedience, God showed His favor on her by blessing her the way He did. And so if God is speaking to you, you really can't afford to ignore it. And expect God to do much for you after. And so if He's speaking to you, maybe in a crowd this side, there's someone here that's never trusted Christ as your Savior. You're what the Bible calls lost. And, and His speaking to you would be uh, along the line of, of uh, coming to Him for salvation. 
he drawing you through your, through your heart. He's speaking to you uh, about being saved. Maybe you've been saved, and, and maybe for years, you know, and you've put off this thing of baptism. And every time you come to a service like this, you can hear God speaking to, to your heart. You know, baptize, baptize, be baptized, follow me in obedience. And you just keep putting him on. Maybe you're, you're here, and, and uh, you have worshipped here with us maybe for quite some time. And you know this is where God wants you just to come and join and, and jump in and go to work. And, and, and you just keep putting God off on that thing. If God is speaking to you this morning, respond positively. Respond in a positive manner uh, is, is uh, my advice to you. It's God's advice to you. And so whatever need you may have this morning, listen to God. Tune in and listen to God and, and what He is calling you to do. In just a moment, we're going to stand, and Brother James, the musicians are going to come. Uh, they're going to lead us in a hymn of decision. Because, see, there's a decision to make. Uh, in, in many regards, a preacher is like an attorney, uh, attorney that is pleading a case. And, and, and you're the jury, and it's time for you to render a verdict. And so this morning, uh, there's the case. And so what, what will you do with it? Uh, what is God calling you to do? What, what's he saying to you this morning? Hi, I'm Roger Copeland, pastor of Northern Hills Baptist Church in Texarkana. We want to thank you for sharing in our services by means of television. Our prayer and desire is that if you don't have a faith relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that even now you would believe on him. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, if you will acknowledge that you're a sinner and in need of Jesus Christ, you can be saved right now by asking the Lord Jesus to save you and to forgive you of your sins. If you need help or someone just to pray with you concerning your walk with Christ, feel free to call on us and at your convenience, We'd love to meet with you and to share God's plan for your life and to pray with you. May the Lord bless you as our prayer.